Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, if it's your first time with us, welcome. Uh, I hope that uh, tonight you have a wonderful experience. Maybe you, you uh, make some new friends here in the congregation. Maybe you'll learn something about the Bible. Maybe you'll teach us something about the Bible that, by making comments in the in the chat room. But uh, I just want you to be feel welcome. And for those uh, regular members, the regular participants in this congregation, uh, welcome back. And uh, thank you for your, your faithful participation. Um, let's, uh, before we uh, I engage anybody in the chat room, let me take a moment now to ask uh, Brother Steve and uh, Brother Cripps to introduce themselves to anybody who may not know who you are yet. Uh, Brother Cripps, why don't you go first, tell them who you are and what you're doing on YouTube. Yes, sir. Thank you, Brother Luke. My name is Jason Cripps, and I'm part of a channel called True Story Live. We come on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Also, Steve's a part of that uh, program as well. I also uh, do this show here with uh, Brother Luke on Wednesdays. He's been uh, gracious to invite me on uh, the panel here, and it's always been great for Bible studies here. Um, I also do some things with uh, Channel Talk and Doctrine from time to time, do some things with them. Um, and let's see, uh, Steve's uh, show on Saturday I'm actually a part of, uh, and he'll talk more about that. But um, it's a, a great thing to be here and to be part of this particular fellowship. And I just try to say yes to everything that comes along when it comes to um, uplifting other believers and trying to uh, live in this broken, fallen world and keep the joy of what Christ has done in our hearts and lives uh, and keep it right there and, and uh, spread it and show it to others. Thank you. Appreciate it. Amen. And. Uh... Thank you, Jesus, for uh, bringing uh, Brother Cripps uh, into the fellowship. And you, and, you know, I hadn't really thought about it before, but uh, you are participating every way you possibly can and really, really contributing to the discussion about Jesus and the Bible. So thanks again so much for, for being uh, such a help. Uh, now, Brother thank Steve, you, Brother. Brother Steve, uh, Take a moment now and, and, and tell everybody what you're up to on YouTube, who you are. Hello, everybody. I am Steve. My channel name is Soldier for Christ. We are at war. Um, and that title pretty much sums up who I am and what my channel is about, um, that I am a soldier in the army of the Lord and that we are indeed in warfare. And so um, the purpose of my channel is to uh, teach about um, and uh, learn together about spiritual warfare and uh, those kinds of things, especially as that, as it pertains to the life of the believer and i would say these are even more so important in these times in which we live and i also uh, as jason said i'm on his channel on sundays at nine true story live and obviously i'm here today with on uh, brother luke's channel and it's always a pleasure to be a part of uh, bible studies uh, with y'all and great to be on the panel thanks again Okay, thank you, brother. I uh, um, I'm uh, grateful that you can uh, join us tonight. Uh, you've um, you're the you're the designated on deck brother, and uh, he shows up whenever you need him, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on this particular program, I think the ideal number is three people, so that we can uh, have varying viewpoints, but also cover a lot of a lot of ground if we had too many people on the panel it, it we wouldn't make much progress so maybe in two hours we might talk to talk about a couple of verses so i think this is the right number and, and normally sister renee uh is with us she's that third person and 
Uh, for those of you who are wondering, well, maybe you all saw the video she put up today. And uh, at the end of the video, she said that she wouldn't be with us tonight. She's just not feeling up to it yet. And uh, so uh, let's, just, let's all just keep praying for Renee's healing and uh, Lord to strengthen her. And, uh, I'm hoping that uh, she'll be able to join us this Sunday on our Sunday uh, church broadcast and, and uh, be back with us next Wednesday. Next Wednesday is a really, really important uh, date because we will, I expect that we'll be getting chapter nine next week. I'll talk more about that later, but for now on, for, 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 for now, let's just uh, focus on the study tonight, which is uh, we're about the middle of chapter eight in Romans. Uh, let's say hi to the guys in the chat room first before we get into the, the study. Uh, by the way, uh, to all those in the chat room, uh, uh, all the people who are regular participants and you have that wrench by your name, you're the moderators. So I ask the moderators to do two things. And one is uh, don't allow the, the trolls to harm the chat room. If you identify someone as a troll, get rid of them. It's not a place to engage trolls. Uh, but uh, if you recognize that someone is new to us, let's take a little time and make an effort to welcome them and uh, make them feel welcome. And, and perhaps they'll, uh, they'll either um, agree with us uh, on uh, the identity of Jesus and the means of salvation. That's what really a person must understand and believe. Um, perhaps they'll, they'll agree with us, and, or perhaps if they don't agree, they'll listen. And, and, and maybe someday come to agree with this this basic doctrine of Christianity. So uh, welcome, whether you're a believer or just curious and you want to learn about uh, <laughs> Jesus and the Bible. That's really what this is all about. Um, okay, so we got uh, uh, Brother Melted Zone. By the way, uh, Melted Zone, Brother Esteban, I will be interviewing him Friday in two days. That'll be at... Uh, uh, 6 30 p.m. Pacific time at 9 30 Eastern time on Friday uh, and so everybody please tune in then and uh, you can learn all about Brother Esteban all the things you always want to know but we're afraid to ask uh, hello Dan a man a new believer hey he's still <laughs> clapping and celebrating still jumping for joy with this gift of eternal life and sister Celine is there and Priscilla uh, Stacy Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for, for being with us. Um, all right. Let's get into this study. And we're starting now with uh, uh, verse 16. Let me read just a, a little bit at the end of verse, uh, the end of the last study, just to kind of bring us up to, to speed where we left off. And then we'll, we'll go right into the next verse. Uh, Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Wow. Okay, so that's to try to give us a little context leading into the next verse, but I, I can't help but saying something about that. At the end of the last study, we were talking about you know, the... The verse that says that uh, you have to have the Holy Spirit in you in order to be a Christian. That's really what determines if you are really a Christian or not. Is the Holy Spirit living in you? Uh, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you're not a Christian. Uh, but how do you get the Holy Spirit? By believing you're guaranteed eternal life from Jesus Christ. You're guaranteed eternal life in heaven because of what he did for you and his promise to you, period. And when you believe that, it becomes a reality. If you don't believe it, you don't receive it. So uh, the idea is, okay, you got to have the Holy Spirit in you. And then, uh, then we want the Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us. Uh, now verse, uh, and then, of course, we're not uh, under the spirit of bondage. And this is what breaks my heart, brothers, Brother Cripps, Brother Steve. I see so many people here talking about verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Wow. 
I, I, it, it breaks my heart when I see uh, so many professing Christians still walking around with fear. And, you hit on something uh, here, Brother Luke. What's that? You hit on something here. Keep going. We'll talk about yeah. this part. I, uh, it's, I told my sister, she was visiting with us uh, yesterday, and she's, I don't really think she's a believer. I've talked to her about Jesus and the gospel for years, and sometimes she says she believes, but then I don't really think she does. She, She's afraid to die, for example. And I was telling her that she asked me how I'm doing. I said, I'm, <laughs> you know how I like to answer. I'm fantastic. The only thing that would be better is if I was dead. <laughs> My sister, I, oh, no, don't say that. I said, you know, the best thing about life, the greatest thing about life is death. <laughs> when I get to leave this and, and be with, with my Savior, Jesus. Uh, but that kind of thought, that kind of uh, attitude uh, is uh, bizarre, strange, weird, and uh, freaky to the world. They don't, they don't get it. And but even among believers, brothers, I'm not seeing believers with that kind of enthusiasm for uh, their, their future, their promise. And, and they have fear, fear and doubt that they're even going to have that. I mean, after all, didn't Jesus promise them eternal life and promise them heaven? If they would just believe in him, they're going to get it. It's guaranteed. And and if they really understand and believe that, why in the world would they have these doubts and fears and we're not supposed to be walking in fear, according, according to verse 15. Yes. It, it says, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. All right, before we go to 16, we've got to address that. Okay, so uh, Brother Cripps, you seem anxious to speak. Oh, yeah, I actually am, because I, I can honestly say for myself, now when I was younger, uh, I allowed the circumstances and things, of the trappings of this life, to ensnare me in in their their clutches, so to speak, and focusing in on you know work and uh, you know being married and things that I enjoy and and stuff like that. Um, it, it's not that I wasn't grateful for what Christ did on the cross, but these things draw you away from the reality of of Christ's promise. So I think a lot of times it's people focus more on the things in this world than they do on eternal things and his word advises us not to do that his word advises us to to focus on uh the things to come and to focus on christ and not as much on the things of this world but when um through through many uh many times when i was taken to the woodshed by the lord uh <laughs> and then other times he came to me gently and said you need to focus on me you need to Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. For, you know, look at that. Don't look, don't look at the world. Don't focus on the things of the world. Focus on me. And then, then my fear started to ebb. He started to work on my fear. Uh, when I replaced what I was focusing on, the external things of this life, and focused on him more. It's the same story I've told almost every week when Peter walks across the water. When he's focused on Christ, he's able to walk towards Jesus. When he doesn't look at Christ anymore, he sinks under the water in the rough seas. And that's a pretty much an example of uh, what I went through for a period of my life. Thank God I'm not doing that anymore. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, isn't, it's so wonderful, brother, to, to, to walk around with joy and peace. Brother Steve, before we get into verse 16, uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, spirit of fear? <laughs> My thoughts on that spirit of fear, um, that's, you know, that's one of those scriptures that, you know, speaks to me, you know, not only that, but like what you guys were saying, but also um, why, why would Paul, this is a question, honest question um, that, I, that I think I have an answer to. But why would why would Paul remind them of that? Why would Paul remind them of the fact that you did not receive a spirit of fear? Um, and elsewhere he says, but of love and uh, what 
is it love, righteousness, and sound mind? Um, so, you know, uh, it's one of those things that Paul does a lot where he stirs us up in our faith by reminding us that we're not to be pursuing things that bring fear to us, that we should be like what you said, we should be focused on the fact that it's Christ who has made us free. Like he starts out at the beginning of this chapter by saying, therefore, there is no more condemnation. You should have no fear of judgment, fear of condemnation, because you are in Christ. You know, and so a lot of this to me is teaching about this spirit of, of fear that you should no longer have as a believer because you've been bought with a price because of all that. And he later goes on in Romans 12, therefore, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable service. So, I mean, he's, he's kind of setting up the stage for that, that idea that, because we should not live in fear, we should live our lives to honor God. And so, you know, don't worry, though a thousand may fall at your at your right side and 10,000 at your left, none shall come nigh thee, as David said in the Psalms. Because for the, if the Lord God is with you, who can stand against you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, do we really believe these words? That's the question. Yeah, if we believe them, uh, then uh, I, I don't see how we can have fear when we have all these promises, like the one you said. <laughs> uh, well, listen, we can't we can't keep a thought from passing into our head sometimes. But fear that you have as a thought coming into your head does not mean that you're choosing to focus on that fear, and. Yeah. If we if we think about the Holy Spirit and his purpose and what he's trying to do in our life, he's the comforter. He's trying to comfort us and grow us and make us stronger and sanctify us. These are all things that he does. So I don't want people, when they, when they have a thought of fear, they have that pop in your head. That happens to all of us. There's no reason for you to think, well, that you know, I'm, I'm not saved or I can't do this or I can't do that. It's a thought that pops in your head. You don't have to focus. You don't have to live in that fear. I think that's what Brother Luke, Luke is uh, mainly talking about is when they walk around every day and they, they live in that fear rather than, um, you know, maybe share it with someone and say, you know, I've been having these fears lately and the Holy Spirit will help you deal with it. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I Maybe uh, it, it would probably be a good idea uh, for each person to have um, a list of these um, great verses, maybe a list of 20 or 30 verses that clearly uh, assure us of our salvation and our security. And, and uh, I have that. I have several pages of, of, of uh, files of, on various topics and a whole bunch of verses that pertain to that particular subject so I can... Faith alone? Okay, here's a bunch of verses on it. Some people ask me to send them some of those, and I have. But if you have those on hand all the time, and then you you know, you know, you end up, at, let's say, forgetting, right? because you're 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 uh, bothered by uh, somebody that's teaching you wrong, or you, you come across a verse that, that puzzles you and seems to contradict our basic beliefs, and you don't understand it, and then you get some doubts about it all, then Go right back to those verses that are clear and, and, and give us these promises and guarantees of eternal life. And, and when you read those, that should reassure us and uh, uh, bring back this, this joy. That's, that's what I, I hope will be the remedy. Um, okay, let's go on to the verse uh, 16 now. Uh, uh, Rare to go. Okay, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. 
So I wrote read 16 and 17 together. At the end of 16, there was a colon. And you know how we talked about this before. Paul's style of writing is he will make a long uh, run on a kind of sentence and put a lot of words and thoughts together in one sentence. So uh, 16 and 17 together, Brother Cripps. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank oh, you. Oh, hey, did you do the that in the Amplified? Not yet. He does that after. No, I know the last scripture. Uh, oh, no. He was just okay. reading from last week. He was reading oh, from last okay. week. Oh, yep. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. I, I thought about it, but I thought that was last week's study. We already really covered it. I was just kind of recapping it to connect this to that last study. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right, go ahead, Brother Cripps. Thank you. Okay, so verse 16, this is so beautiful. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. This is when people are struggling with these things. You have that other voice inside you. If, you've, if you have believed what Christ has done for you, then when you have that fear creep in, whatever it is, you have that other voice, that still small voice, that's saying to you, do not fear, I am with you. Do not fear, I am with you. Do not fear, I am with you. He's saying that to you. If you hear that still small voice saying that to you, then you can cast out the fear immediately. You don't have to focus on it. It says right here, verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. In other words, he's communicating with us and telling us that we're his child, that we are the children of God. So then verse 17, and if we are children, so if, if verse 16 is true, then Paul goes on to say, and if children, then heirs. So we're heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. So we share everything with Christ. What a wonderful Savior we have that's willing to share everything with us. We're, we're as if we're just like Jesus in the end. What a beautiful thing. That's his grace that gives that to us, his grace and his love for us. Join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we, we may be also glorified together. So we suffer in this present world in varying degrees. You know, if we live in America right now, right now there's there's verbal persecution for Christians. We don't have physical persecutions very often here. But in other countries, people are dying for the faith. Uh, we're actually pretty blessed. We're still pretty protected here in America, but it does seem to be getting worse. So we need to watch out for that. But we suffer all the suffering that we do here in this broken, fallen world. We go through that because Christ went through it. He even gave up his life for us. Hopefully uh, that won't happen to us, but if we live long enough toward the end times, then we may have to suffer exactly the way that he suffered. But that all happens together so that when we get home, when we get home to be with him and we see each other there, we will also be glorified together. I got to tell you that I've been waiting for this, this 16, verse 16 in particular, but then verse 17 comes right behind it. And talk about celebrating what God's done in our hearts and lives. And this is incredible. I think I, I get joy just from reading it again, even though I know this verse. It's wonderful. Steve? I'd like to go next and let Steve go last on this one here. Uh, yes, sir, uh, Brother Luke. Uh, I, I'm going to, um, I wanted to respond to something Steve said uh, in the last uh, few minutes ago talk about there's a problem. Paul does this. He's talking about a problem. I don't remember exactly how you phrased it, Steve, but it, it, is, a, it is a recurring thing in all of Paul's epistles where uh, he brings up an issue and, 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 uh, and, the, and he'll explain the issue and, and, and the, give an answer to the issue. But why is he bringing up an issue? Because there is an issue that exists in the church uh, in Rome at that time in history. This was a problem that existed then. But guess what? All the problems we see in the epistles, we still see today. Uh, the problems haven't gone away, but we fortunately we have Paul's answers to, to refer to, to, to help us. But we still have, you know, a lot of heresies and false teachers and things to deal with. And in this case, the, the problem is, this spirit of fear. And so just like today, people have this spirit of fear. Some of the people back then had the spirit of fear. So Paul is saying, first of all, you need to understand that 
a Christian has the Spirit of God living in them. If you don't have the Spirit of God living in you, you're not a Christian. That's what the point I made earlier. That's what a Christian is. Christ's Spirit lives in us. Christ in us, we're in Christ. Um, and then it says that because the Spirit's in you, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, we don't have a spirit of fear. We should, that's not the, the Holy Spirit giving us this fear. Uh, it's the, uh, he says, uh, this, the Spirit of God is bearing witness to our spirit. So the Spirit of God is there as the Comforter. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the Comforter. He's going to bear witness to the truth of our salvation so we don't have to have these fears uh, that, that we are the children of God. And then he says, and if children, now if is an important thing. Because you have to be a child of God to have this experience where this Holy Spirit is bearing witness to you. If the Holy Spirit of God is not bearing witness to you, perhaps you don't even have the Holy Spirit, and maybe you better rethink what you're even putting your faith in. Maybe your faith has been tainted by adding some kind of works to it. So you need to rethink all that and, and consider what? Examine your, yourself, whether you be in the faith. That doesn't, I think that's asking us to look, what do you actually really believe? What is your faith based upon? And so he says, if we are children, that means if the Holy Spirit is in you and you are then therefore, therefore a child of God, then you're also an heir, an heir to God and joint heirs with Christ. Uh, let me read those 1670 in the Amplified, and then Steve, I'll ask you to respond at all. 1617 in the Amplified says, the Spirit himself testifies and confirms together with our spirit, assuring us that we believers are children of God. And if we are his children, then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his spiritual blessing and inheritance if indeed we share in his sufferings, so that we may also share in his glory. Okay, that, oh, I think that's helpful, beautifully stated in the Amplified. Brother Steve, amplify it for us yourself. Uh, praise, praise God, praise God. Um, spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Script and and scriptures like this should when they're read if you are a believer i would say they should resonate with your spirit and and um if you are struggling in an area with 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 something especially if you've fallen under you know what what i think paul is saying in verse 15 the for you have not received if i was to translate it today for you have not received the spirit of lordship salvation <laughs> but you know um you have received yes. the spirit of adoption yes which you know uh the, you have received you have received the spirit of the free grace gospel of no works salvation whereby we cry Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, Father, through, you know, through the provision of the Father, through the provision of the Son, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, bringing us to Christ, who brings us to the Father. Um, and that spirit that now resides in us, when we hear scriptures like this, they, sh they should resonate inside you saying, yes, that is, that is the truth, uh, you know, uh, that is in me. You know, not this spirit of fear of bondage, which is the law. The law brings bondage. And so when, you know, when scriptures like this are read and then the following, and if children, if believers, if saved, then you are an heir, an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. And we will probably suffer persecutions and all kinds of things for him. But 
because of that suffering, we will also be glorified together when he returns and we receive the adoption, the actual adoption when we when we have our glorified bodies. It's, it's a wonderful promise that we have to look forward to. And um, my answer to like with what my question was about um, why would Paul write these things? And I think your answer was great, you know, Luke, about, um, you know, that 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 number one, uh, you that this should bear witness as you read it with your spirit that, you know, that you are a child of God when, when these are read. Um, but I also think it's like, um, uh, if you are feeling fear, have you turned your eyes from your savior and started looking at something else, the world, the winds and the waves and gotten distracted by a Lordship preacher or something else. And I would say, that in some sense, Paul is giving them fuel to fight against the lordship type heresy that's trying to cause you fear to make to try to make you unprofitable as a as a as a child of God as being a living sacrifice. Because when that when you when you really understand the grace of God it passes all understanding and it it uh um it guides you because of the fact that you understand that nothing you can do can separate you from the love of Christ nothing no sin no nothing can separate you once you are saved and in his arms, in his hands. And so it's kind of like Paul is is saying, did you receive the, the spirit of fear? No, you received the spirit, the spirit of adoption. Um, and so he's doing in his writing what they should be doing on their own, like in 2 Corinthians 10, um, uh, 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So like Jason was saying before, just because you have a thought come in doesn't mean that you're not saved. It simply means Paul is saying, that's not the spirit you received. Don't fight back with the, re- with the knowledge that you have been saved by grace through faith and not of works. And nothing can separate you. So I think that's, you know, he's reminding them who saved them and the promise of the adoption. That's what you've received, the promise that Nothing can separate you once you're saved and you will be made completely perfect and whole when Christ comes again. Wow. You know what you just said there kind of sounds kind of familiar to me. (laughs) Uh, Oh, here's another amazing thing. Uh, This, this Bible here. I think someone was talking about how to how to study it, different suggestions on how to go about reading it and how often and uh, all that. But um, uh, we all have different periods of time in our life where we've been studying this and relying on this for our truth. And I, I'm amazed how many times it's just it's just routinely whatever the issue is. When you start studying the Bible, all of a sudden, that particular issue pops up right where you happen to be. He provides us the scriptures, what we need at the time we need it, and we need these scriptures now. Because this problem of fear, 
that Paul is talking about in these verses. As we, and as we continue on, this portion of scriptures is the answer to this problem of people having these fears. And so uh, uh, you've all had that experience, I'm sure, Brother Cripps and Brother Steve, that you know, you're reading the Bible and now and then exactly what you need to hear right then is, is right in front of your eyes at the time you need it. Um, yes, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I want to also emphasize that some of you who uh, are not familiar with me and, and this program here is uh, we, we had a question on Sunday about the KJV only question and which Bible translations and in my position is that I'm KJV first. You notice we read the KJV and talk about it. But I also like to look at other translations sometimes if it will be helpful. And the one that I find most helpful usually is the Amplified. But uh, in this case, the Amplified is uh, telling us um, a word that is, uh, we don't see that word in the uh, KJV, assured, but according to the Amplified, and according to my interpretation of verses 16 and 7, that's exactly what this is talking about. So let me read that portion again in the Amplified. The Spirit himself testifies and confirms together with our spirit, assuring us that we believers are children of God. And we know that uh, when Jesus talked to Nicodemus, and for that matter, when Jesus talked to many of these, uh, the, the Sanhedrin, these le Jewish religious leaders, uh, the, the problem always was that they didn't understand anything spiritual. They didn't know, think spiritual language as well. How can you rebuild this temple when it, in three days it took our fathers 40 years? And they, phew, right over their head. They didn't understand. He's, it's a spiritual thing about his death, burial, and resurrection. And as being born again. How can they go back into my mother's womb? Stupid. It's spiritual language he's using. And uh, so, um, I forgot why I was even saying that, but the, uh, the idea of um, being assured uh, is what we're, we really want to get out of these verses here. I'll probably I'll think of it and when you when one of you is talking what I was the point I was leading to. <laughs> That's the way it always works, brother. Yes. Yeah. The nice thing about this though is this condition is that I can watch a movie or something and then later on could stumble across the movie and watch it again, not even remembering that I've already seen it. I can enjoy things a second time. <laughs> um okay. Uh so the uh the idea that um this assurance that we are children of God and God, he wants us to have that assurance. In fact, I argue that that is the gospel. The gospel is I am assured. I am guaranteed. I am certain I'm going to heaven because Jesus promised it to me. And that's the conclusion we must come to. Uh, uh, that that's when the Holy Spirit enters us, when we are convinced and we believe we are saved because of what Jesus did and that reason alone. And, and, uh, and this word assuring us, assuring us, sometimes we need to be reassured and it's unfortunate. And you could say, well, if, if someone loses their assurance, starts having fears and doubts, maybe it could indicate that maybe they never believed. I don't know if they believe or not. Uh, but if the Holy Spirit says here, it testifies to us. He says, if you are a child of God, then you got the Holy Spirit in you. And if the Holy Spirit is in you, it will bear witness. And then also we have the scriptures. As you read these scriptures, that will also reinforce, strengthen your, your faith and reassure you. So maybe some people need to be reassured and maybe some other people never had the assurance and didn't even get it. it the, the real gospel of your assured salvation. It's settled. Don't worry, nothing can change it. That's what this end of this chapter is all about. Maybe they missed that point when they heard the gospel. They didn't get that. because But that's, that's the point of the gospel, this assurance. All right, let me read uh, uh, the next verse in the KJV, verse uh, 19. 
no, 7, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. I better stop there. 18 and 19. Let's go. Let's Brother Steve go first on this one. Keep you guys on your toes, never knowing who's going to go to go next. <laughs> I watch out for that all the time, so yes. Praise God. Praise God. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He's talking about that adoption again. He's talking about also, I think, you know, um, as, uh, you know, he's talking about two things, really. You know, he's talking about the fact that you already are saved and the glory that w will be revealed in you at, at that great day that, that, that we long for that he talks about in the next verse, you know, um, but that also as we, as, as we, you know, walk with God and, and he transforms us daily, that, that, that progressive sanctification, that as we walk with him, like we talked about on, on my broadcast this past Saturday, as we abide in him, you know, apart from him, we can do nothing. But as we abide in him, that that glory that that is revealed in us and then through us to be salt and light in the world, you know, um, that's another part of this glory that that shall be revealed. But uh, it, it's really he's mainly talking about the 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 heirship, the the being heirs of of God, the glory that we will receive, the the glorified body. Um, when this this corruptible shall perish away and we put on incorruptibility, we put on immortality, as First Corinthians 15 talks about at the end of the chapter, because God gives immortality and because God alone is immortal, you know, that we must put on immortality given to us only by God. And so verse 19, for the earnest expectation, this is an earnest expectation. Um, uh, I think another scripture says the, the Holy Spirit, which is the seal uh, of the believer, that is the earnest, which is the down payment on the future uh you know, redemption of the of the body that that, that Paul is talking about here. Um and it, I don't remember where that is or the exact uh, wording, but I think that applies to this as well. For the earnest expectation, this sure expectation because of the seal of the Holy Spirit, it is sure and a sure expectation of the, of the creature, of the believer that, that waits for the manifestation of the sons of God, the earnest expectation of us of us believers we wait for that manifestation for that to appear at the coming of our lord jesus christ when he comes and brings with him you know uh everything to give to us and and all that other stuff that, that i want to stay away from because it doesn't pertain exactly to this but you know he comes on a white horse to do battle to destroy the the kingdoms of this world and to set up you know his millennial reign and all that but um you know that's what we're longing for to be to to no longer have this suffering in this sinful world this sin-stained world I mean, I can't even totally, I can't totally imagine or comprehend what that day will be like, but I know it's going to be glorious. I know it's going to be beautiful because to no longer have to struggle against sin, I mean, what a beautiful thing. And just be able to worship and praise God together um, 
That's what we're longing for. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm learning to recognize your speech patterns and realize when you've stopped your point. I don't want to interrupt you when you're, and then find out that you're, oh, you just caught your breath. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's why, I, uh, do you want me to say I'm done? Uh, on what? Do you want me to say I'm done when I'm done? Oh, no, no. I, I <laughs> sometimes I, I pause. Sometimes I pause like I know, and I'm grateful that you do that. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that because sometimes I pause and then like God tells me, say one more thing, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, that's, again, that's another advantage of having three people is that uh, we don't have to like put a stopwatch in play and cut everybody's time short so that everybody gets a turn with three of us. We don't really have that issue. So that's why I like this kind of format. But uh, OK, Brother Cripps, but before you uh, you talk about that, I remembered what I was saying. I'll just finish that point there that when I'm talking about how uh, this child of God and the Nicodemus and being born again, I was relating that to this idea that we are a child of God. And that as a child of God, Nicodemus couldn't understand that this is a spiritual thing. And so he's trying to figure it out. How can I go back to my mother's womb and be born again? And of course you can't. But what many Christians haven't understood is this is also true spiritually. We cannot go back and undo the spiritual birth. It's an event. It happened. It's done. You'd have to be able to go back in time before you believed, before you were regenerated, and the Holy Spirit baptized you and sealed you. You'd have to be able to go back before that point in time and, and never hear and believe. Uh, so it cannot be undone. And so that's a reason that we... We should not be, that's why the point of being a child is so important to understand. If you're a child, you can't ever be uh, changed from not being a child. Uh, the, prod the story of the prodigal son, which I, I like to call the, the story of the backslidden son. I don't know what prodigal is except for uh, in the Bible, but the, 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 he's really a backslidden son. But all the time he's gone and, and until the time he comes back, he did not change his standing and his status as the son of this man. No matter how much he wallowed in the pig's pen with the pigs, he never changed into a pig. He was still a son living like a pig. Uh, so uh, we, there's a video that I've recommended many times by a YouTube called uh, Street Preacher 1611. And, and he made a little short video that's animated. It's called Standing and State. It's the best video I've ever seen to explain this difference between our standing as a child of God is constant. Nothing will change that. But the state at any moment in time, we could be either, you know, in the spirit, walking in the spirit or not. So, uh, okay, uh, Brother Cripps. Uh, Oh, let me read the read in the Amplified so you have the benefit of that before you respond, okay? It was almost like cheating, uh, giving you this. I didn't let the first person use it, but that's the way I am. Okay, in the Amplified, uh, for I consider from the standpoint of faith that the sufferings of the present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us, to us and in us. For even the whole creation, all nature, waits eagerly for the children of God to be revealed. Okay, Brother Cripps. Okay, well, first of all, uh, off the comment that you just made, prodigal means extraly extravagant, characterized by wasteful expenditure, yielding abundantly. And no, I didn't look it up. I actually was in a musical when I was a kid, and that was one of my lines. Uh, it was a, a musical about uh, some of the uh, Jesus stories, including the the law, the coin collection, and the prodigal son, and stuff like that. So in that song, let me let me respond just quickly. Then, since you did define it that way, uh, that that reinforces my conclusion that uh, a translator or a publisher who inserts the t the title the story of the prodigal son, because the word prodigal is not in the Bible, uh, 
but the publishers, you know, sometimes they put little uh, titles above a, ch a chapter or a portion of scripture to tell you what this, these portions were about. This portion of scripture is coming up. This is the title we're going to give that part. And uh, sometimes that can be helpful. But in this case, it's absolutely wrong because that's really not what we're supposed to be getting out of that those scriptures, that, that, that he's extravagant. We're supposed to be getting out of it. What we've said here is that his status as the man's son never changed, no matter how he lived. Yep. Okay, brother, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no problem whatsoever. Um, that particular word and that particular story for me has always been so powerful because it's not just a story about the one son, but about both sons. It's about the son that, that stayed at home and was uh, self-righteous, was not willing to come into the party once the prodigal came home and uh he he stayed out stayed out from the party he wouldn't go in said well you've never thrown a party for me you've never killed the fatted calf for me it's very 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 selfish and so there's a lot there as well um but as far as when uh, the thing was when steve was uh, giving his um uh, definition or uh, amplifying these two verses i had that excited feeling in my chest when i'm thinking about the glory, the end of this, um, how it's going to be revealed. Uh, I, gosh, I get it. I get ex this excited feeling because it it's unbelievable. I mean, we live in this in this world, this realm that we're in now, and we're thinking about what's going to happen in the future, in our future, and of course, being joiners with Christ. And uh, as Steve was mentioning, you know, the glorified body, the glory of that. And uh, it's going to be beyond everything we could even ask for or think. So if you can think of it, it's beyond that. Uh, that blows my finite mind. <laughs> I mean, I cannot fathom. It is unfathomable uh, to understand how wonderful and amazing it's going to be. I mean, this, this is beyond compare, the idea of, of uh, ha being changed in the blink of an eye and and this flesh, this zombie body that we're all walking around in, will be removed and will be given a new eternal body and will forever be with the Lord and with each other. Uh, you know, we'll be able to do, you know, Jesus was the first fruits of that body. And uh, we know some of the things he was able to do. He's able to walk through walls or he's able to appear in, in one place and be gone uh, the next. Uh, some people believe he could change his appearance. Uh, you know, I wasn't there to see it myself, but there's definitely some things that were going on there that, uh, that we don't get to do. We don't have those kind of powers, but the point of it is, is though the glory, which shall be revealed in us, I, I, I can't wait. And I just have this feeling of excitement and that ties back into what brother Luke was saying toward the beginning, this, this fear that we have, we should have joy. We should have joy in, in, in feeling this and understanding that we're seated in the heavenly heavenly places right now because God is outside of time and he sees everything all at once. He sees before time, he sees during time, and he sees after time. He's not just the God of time, he's the God of timing. And he knows when all this is gonna take place, we don't. But meanwhile, it should be comforting to us to realize that this present state that we're in, it's temporary. And that we have so much to look forward to the expectation of the creature, that's us, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. We are the sons of God. We look forward to that manifestation. There's other verses that talk about the creation itself longs for this as well. All the trees, everything God's created longs for that to happen as well. Because uh, they're, they're under stress. They're under stress, and we may not understand that because in this world we can't go out and talk to a tree. I'm not saying in, in, in the, the new world that we'll be able to talk to trees and flowers. I, I don't know that. But it says that they that that they long for it as well. So maybe there's some things that, that we don't understand about the creation yet because we're in this particular uh, broken world. Um, I, I, all I know is it's exciting. And it's easier if you have any kind of fear to focus on things like what Paul's bringing up here and uh, waiting for the, that manifestation of the sons of God, to, for us to be sons of God. i just very excited, and um, I think that's helpful.
you know, to not focus on the fear part, but focus on uh, what is to come. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is exciting. <laughs> well, uh, let me let me uh, go through a little portion. I think is very important to get. He, he says for the well, first of all, the sufferings. He says, I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Uh, well, uh, do you think that uh, the sufferings it, uh, with, uh, within the church congregation that Paul's talking about, the fact that they're suffering, uh, do you think that the suffering stopped it? You know, first century? <laughs> but certainly not. Uh, when you study church history, the, the suffering got worse and worse. It became really almost genocide. Uh, the, uh, the Dark Ages is famous for that. And, and a lot of people believe today that there is going to be a rapture before the tribulation period, so the church is taken away and and going to be spared any any suffering. And uh, we've never been spared suffering throughout all of church history. Well, and why would why would we now be special and be taken away uh, be, uh, to be spared suffering? Um, uh, I, I'm just telling you, brace yourself. Uh, many people are suffering right now, not just suffering because of we're sick or we're 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 being persecuted uh, or or we're, we're it, it, some people today even around the world are imprisoned and persecuted in that way because of their their Christian faith. So it hasn't stopped. It's still going on today. It will get worse and worse. Uh, so I don't get your hopes up. I would not I encourage anybody to get their hopes up. I would say brace yourself. Because if you live long enough and, and you're there for the very end, when just before the return of Jesus, it can be like birth pain come closer together, more intense until a climax of history, and it's going to be ugly. And uh, of course, the Lord's not going to be hurting the, the, the believers, but uh, I don't think the Lord's going to be hurting even the non-believers. But the 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 the, the, the situation of the the turmoil of the world uh, is going to be so bad that, that uh, you, you can't really avoid suffering diseases and, and uh, injuries to your body and, and persecution so I, I just don't see that we're going to be but, uh, spared that and taken out but uh, this is telling us okay even though you are suffering right now uh, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory and that's another thing about there. You have things that are temporal and things that are eternal. Uh, that's another reason you can't compare it. Suffering and even this this uh, this mortal mortal life that we have right now, uh, we have immortality at the resurrection. We will be raised to eternal life, but right now we are all waiting for death of this body, and until that happens. Uh, you can expect there's going to be some suffering, but that's temporary. Even if someone lived to be 100 years old, that's just a grain of sand in time compared to eternity. Throughout eternity, it's going to be so good. The verse in the Bible you, you were alluding to, uh, I think it says, uh, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined the good things God has prepared for those who love him and that's really talking about the uh, our eternal life in the new heaven the new earth and eternity um, i have a playlist titled 50 hours in heaven and i'm happy to tell you i've had a couple of comments recently there are a couple of people who have decided to take on this 50 hour study the reason it's called 50 hours in heaven it's not because I had some out-of-body experience. I went to heaven for 50 hours, and I'm getting back to tell you about it. No. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. It's 50 hours in heaven because our study on the subject of heaven in the Bible, uh, it took 50 hours of content in the video. So there's a lot of stuff about heaven that people don't even realize. 
Uh, they're in the Bible, and there's much speculation that is fair to for us to engage in about about eternity in heaven. But um, some people told me that hey, they've watched like uh, you know ten hours or fifteen hours and working their way through it. So if you haven't taken on that, the happiest time you'll ever have in your life is studying. Your, the promise that you have waiting for you. That's going to make you really, really happy. Amen. But then the second part of this verse here, the the uh, part about the earnest, the earnest expectation. Uh, I think there's another verse that uses the term earnest deposit uh, somewhere, but uh, it's kind of like a, uh, a transaction in in, uh, in real estate, I, I bought and sold a lot of real estate. And you know, you you make an earnest deposit, and then later on, you have to come up with your full down payment or the pay off the balance and with some kind of a loan. And but uh, the earnest deposit is what you give them initially to to secure it, so that you know it's okay. You've got it. You don't need to worry. You secured it with the earnest deposit. And so, uh, when we see this earnest uh, regarding us and Jesus, the earnest deposit was the Holy Spirit coming into us. When you believe that you're guaranteed eternal life because of what Jesus did for you and for that reason alone, the Holy Spirit came into you. That's the earnest deposit God's giving you in good faith saying, I'm transforming you into a child of God. And your spirit is being brought to life. The Holy Spirit of God is united with your spirit and you're alive spiritually now. And that's just the beginning. Because someday I'm going to also finish the job regenerating you with a regenerated body that will never get sick or old or die. And uh, um, that's that's also part of our promise. Uh, um, all right, I guess we covered that enough. Any more before I go to the next verses? Um, I'm just going to say I found that verse that you're talking about. All right, so go ahead. Ephesians 1, um, 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession Unto the praise of his glory. Woohoo! Yahoo! All right. Oh man, I got this guarantee. I got a promise from Jesus. It's it's almost exactly like verse 19 for the er earnest expectation. Yeah, yeah. If you get a promise from Jesus, that's our earnest expectation in Ephesians 1, 13, 14. It's certain if it, Jesus promised it. Amen. It's assured. Yes. Amen. And, you know, uh, that that uh, what we the term blessed assurance um, is something that uh, uh, every believer really needs to have in order to get saved you, you that your, your mind is okay i'm i got i'm blessed because i'm assured eternal life because of jesus but sometimes people they lose this joy and assurance yeah so you could argue that well maybe they never really believed i think say maybe they did sometimes people do believe and they lose this joy and this assurance uh, because they're not very smart about the scriptures and they get talked into different different gospel and and uh it is i think that's possible but you know, whatever it is it's sad it's crushing and heartbreaking uh it, when i meet somebody who doesn't have no longer has this joy and peace and blessed assurance are you are, are you full of joy and peace brothers yes sir wonderful Okay, let's let's go to the next verse. Uh, uh, verse uh, twenty. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
Brother Cripps, it's your first turn to go first. Do you want me to read the Amplified for you first, or are you, is that clear to you? Well, it's clear to me, but go ahead and read the Amplified, then both of us will have it. All right. Okay. You want me to be fair. Boy, okay. <laughs> okay. In the Amplified, it says, For the creature was subjected to frustration and futility, not willingly because of some intentional fault on its part, but by the will of him who subjected it in a hope that the creation itself will also be freed from its bondage to decay and gain entrance into the glorious freedom of the children of God. That's pretty good, actually. Yeah, that, that is an amplification for sure. Um, the, so, again, we're the creature. Uh, so we go through this this life, this period of time that we're in now. And what we have to look forward to is what we talked about in verse uh, 18 and 19, which is the glorification at some uh, at some point together. And uh, again, in verse 21, uh, Paul does that same thing he's done so many times. And here's the uh, point counterpoint or the contrast. And uh, the word is uh, the sentence is delivered from the bondage of corruption. That's that's the 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 sin man, the zombie uh, corruption, the corruption of that that we're born into in this world, and that decrepit condition of our soul before uh, we're made alive or born again because of Christ. So there's the there's the contrast, the bondage of corruption, but here's the here's the promise, here's the beautiful beautiful promise, the glorious the glorious liberty of the children of God, that's us. We should be walking in that glorious liberty right now, even though we're still in this flesh suit. We've been given the promise. We know that it's coming. That's what the verses above were talking, that expectation, that expectation of what's to come should be what we cling to as far as our the joy that we have, the peace that Brother Luke was asking us. Do we, do we feel joy and peace? My answer was immediately, yes, yes, I feel joy and peace. Doesn't mean that my circumstances are good. I still have to live in this corrupt world, which is bondage. If I don't have the liberty of Jesus Christ, I live in constant bondage. So we're subjected to that now for the reason of that we have a hope. We have hope in him. We're subjected to the same in hope. So everything that we're going through now is for the reason of having hope and the promise that he's given to us. And gosh, that again, that makes me excited too. It gives me that feeling in my chest, that excitement, uh, because I know that it's coming. I can trust what God has told us in his word. I can trust what Paul is saying through the influence of the Holy Spirit right here. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you, brothers? Yes, and before Steve, uh, before your turn, I, I, I want to demonstrate something here okay oops oh that's my scale i weigh myself every day make sure i'm not getting any weight and when you bump it it talks to me okay watch this oh no oh gosh no oh i gotta be oh, i'm walking on eggshells oh no the slightest little mistake i make I might not go to heaven. Oh, no. Well, <laughs> that is how people are living who don't have this assurance. But here it says that we are delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So we're not under bondage, having to walk around on eggshells in fear that the slightest little mistakes that we make somehow, God's going to reject us now. I had that salvation, but now I don't. And so it's uh, we're delivered from that. You should be delivered from that. If you're not delivered from that, examine your faith. What do you actually believe? And uh, the glorious liberty. So now I can walk around with joy and confidence, light on my feet, and that's not even not a worry in the world. Hey, life is great, but being with Jesus would be better. <laughs> uh, 
That's why he said, <laughs> the best part of life is death. Now, the world will not understand that because it's morbid. It's about death. That's what morbid means, you know? But you understand it. The best part of this life is when it ends and I finally get to be with Jesus. And so you don't have to walk around on, uh, like in bondage from fear constantly because now we're delivered from that. We have glorious liberty. Brother, St Brother Stephen? Yes, yes, yes. Praise God. We do have that. And not only, again, I, do I think, you know, Paul is reminding believers of that, you know, um, but uh, uh, let me read through the verse. Uh, For the creature was made subject to vanity. Um, and I like how the Amplified puts it there. Um, For the creature was subject to frailty. To futility, c condemned to frustration. At least that's my amplified. I know mine's a little bit different than yours because it's probably an older version. Um, but um, I think, you know, uh, the creature was made subject to the flesh, the flesh that is that is death, that is sin, that is. That's why Paul says earlier in Romans uh, for the. The strength of sin is the law. The law is perfect, but it brings bondage because the flesh is not perfect and cannot be perfect uh, without the imputed righteousness of Christ. Um, and it says not willingly because we were all born in, uh, you know, into this world Um and and we're covered by grace until the age of of, of the quote unquote age of accountability, whatever that is. Um, but you know, uh, once we get to that place of being able to, and God knows for every person. Um, but uh, you know, all of us were made subject to the flesh, and uh, He goes on to say but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope so for each of us we've also who believe have been subjected the same hope of of this 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 future um expectation this future earnest expectation so um by reason of Christ who hath subjected all of us in the flesh to the to to the hope and because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption from the bondage of the flesh he's still talking about that adoption we've received the spirit of adoption but we haven't actually had the adoption happen yet that 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 Ephesians 1 was talking about as well um that, that we wait for the adoption. We've been given the seal, the spirit of adoption that seals us until the day of redemption that is the adoption of our bodies, that is the putting on immortality um, given by God. But the creature, us, believers, shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption, the corrupted flesh, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And that will be liberty because we will be completely free. Right now we have a standing of freedom. We, we, are, we are already seated in heavenly places, but we haven't had the actualization of that happen yet, but it's done in the mind and will of God upon belief and so you know uh it's it's it, he's he's you know explaining how how we went from being in bondage because we live in the flesh and to the fact that we will be delivered as believers we will be completely set free we're supposed to live as if we're free 
you know, and 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 abide in Christ, thereby crucifying the flesh so that we can honor God with our bodies and present them as a reasonable service to him to be salt and light in the earth. But because we are live in the flesh, our hope, our steadfast, sure, assured hope is the that that coming day of the adoption of the saints being given glorified bodies being completely liberated thanks amen steve yes amen all right uh i think yeah did i start i start with you brother crip so uh and what, unless there's more on that let's go to the next verse verse 22 for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Uh, I'll go first on this one just to change it up and also because it, there's not a lot to say about this, I don't think. You guys may have watched more than me, but uh, we, we know that at the fall, and by the way, uh, the biblical account of creation and the uh, of Adam and Eve and the fall of the garden. This is a historical account. It's not a mythology and some fairy tale to teach us some kind of moral lesson. It's history. And uh, uh, when at, at the fall, all of creation was part of the fall. And we, we know that Adam and Eve uh Bible says that they uh, they would die the day that they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, we were told that they lived for another eight or nine hundred years. Um, back in those days, many people in the Bible lived for um, almost a thousand years. Um, but um, that's before the toll has uh, the, the fall of the. the the results and consequences of the fall has taken its full toll on, on humanity. Uh, now, of course, we don't live that long. And that's, uh, our lifespan's gotten less because gradually it's, we've got our situations become more, more and more dire. Uh, it's, but Adam and Eve did die that day, spiritually. The Bible says that the Spirit of God was breathed into them. But then the Bible says that the Spirit of God withdrew. At the fall, God withdrew from them. And so they had their spirit kind of like this stub. Imagine that here I am, and this represents my spirit. And God, the whole spirit withdrew from Adam and Eve. And now I'm left with a stub of the spirit, and it's dead. It's just like a, you know, a branch of a tree or something that's like, it's not even alive anymore. But when I believe, the Holy Spirit uh, joined my spirit and quickened it and brought me to life spiritually. So they did die that day spiritually, and all of their descendants have been walking around dead spiritually. So as Brother Cripps likes to refer to us as zombies, the walking dead. Yeah, our bodies and our minds are alive and functioning, uh, but we don't have a living, functioning spirit. Uh, but we do now because as Christians, we're born again spiritually. So that's all solve solve the problem but the point i'm making is at the fall the consequences not only applied to adam and eve personally but it became a a defect in the gene code and all of the descendants of adam and eve are have inherited a birth defect now, when i was born i was born wrong born with a birth defect a sin nature and mortality I will sin because that's what I am and I will die because I'm mortal. And of course, those problems are solved because Jesus now has given me eternal life. So I'm uh, spiritually brought to life and have the promise of eternal life. But I'm also uh, uh, the, uh, the, the mortality problem is solved, but the sin problem will not be solved as long as I'm living in this body that has the sin nature. So I have this struggle. Paul talked about that, and I think it's chapter six, the struggle between the old man and the new man, the, 
the new person born again spiritually a child of god versus the old man the flesh and the, and, uh, the sin nature um, so we are adam and eve uh, that happened to them because of their sin we've inherited it but it doesn't stop there all of creation the earth itself is uh, is affected by the fall that i believe is what this is referring to when it says that oh uh, let me see where is it verse 22 for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. All of creation is groaning, anxious, desiring this new birth. And of course, we know that God's going to recreate heaven and earth. And so, all right, that's I've said more than I intended to say on that. So, uh, Brother Cripps, why don't you go first? Where yes, sir. So I, I admit. I already went first, so you go second. Oh, Steve can go if he wants. Steve, you want to go? No, I meant I meant I went first. Oh, you I, went first. I got you. You were going. I said you can go first, but I didn't recognize that I had already taken the first first turn. So I understand you. You cleared it up. Thanks, uh, thanks, Brother Luke. So um, I mentioned this earlier, and, and guys, just bear with me for a second because I I am going to to try to make a point here, but some of this is based on my imagination, uh, and that is uh, some of it is based on what I believe the Garden of Eden had been like. So before sin entered, um, I'm not saying that Adam and Eve could communicate with the trees and flowers and, uh, or anything like that. But what we do know is that they got along with the animals. That's another benefit of sin not being a part of that uh, creation whatsoever. We know that after sin entered into the world, there were many changes, not just to our flesh, as Brother Luke was saying, that you know they lived for a very long time, uh, uh, almost to a thousand years, some, some folks. Um, so it took a long time for the sin to take its full effect. Uh, so in the, in the beginning, getting along with animals, not having animals want to kill you, not being afraid of man, all those things were, were likely a factor. Um, when, you, when you consider things that are harmful to humans that are in nature now, I don't think any of those things existed. We know that when the ground was cursed, when, when God said to Adam as part of the, his curse, he'll work by the sweat of his own brow and the, uh, the earth won't give up uh, crops uh, like it did before. Um, he'll have to work it and have to till the ground and, and there'll be thorns and thistles. Um, that says to me that before sin entered in, there wasn't thorns and thistles. There weren't harmful things. There may not have been poison ivy. For all we know, poison ivy was a, a beautiful flower that had some kind of benefit to it before sin entered. Uh, either way, if all that's just craziness, or <laughs> as Hendrix just put in the chat, I'm mad. <laughs> I may be mad. Uh, but all these, all these things, when before sin entered, we know that nature was different. And uh, animals were different. Just like we're different, it affected the entire creation. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation, that's everything, everything groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now they have the Savior. The Savior has entered in the world, and though they're still in that state, everyone knows, including us, we know that this, this time, this period of time is temporary, and it won't be like this forever when God creates the new heaven and the new earth, and we're, we're existing there, we won't have that. We'll have bountiful fruits and vegetables. The ground will yield its crop to, to its full power. Everything will be like that. We'll be able to, to lay down to the lion, and the kids will be able to play with the uh, snake. Um, that, that's a completely different scenario. It's going to be restored back to the way it was in the garden. And so the whole creation is under the effects of sin, including us. So this this verse is is promising. It's promising not just to the creation, but to us, and knowing that this wonderful uh, experience will be restored, the experience that Adam and Eve had in the garden. And that includes that, I, you know, I believe that they were like super people in, in a way, Adam and Eve, I mean, before sin entered. I believe they could do many things that we can't do today, but that'll all be restored 
nature will be restored. We'll have the river of life flowing and uh, the, the, the tree of life, or rather the tree of, the tree of life, and we'll, it, it will benefit all the nations. We'll be able to, to, to eat that fruit and enjoy it, and uh, we won't have any sin anymore. We won't have aging and all the things that plague us now as a result of sin. So uh, it's a very promising verse. That's all. I am mad, Brother Hendricks. Mad. I, uh, I think it's fair for you to imagine and speculate. Um, Matthias likes to do that a lot, and I always enjoy his, uh, his speculations about things. And comes up with a lot of opinions and conclusions that are uh, unique and interesting. Uh, he doesn't put them forth just like you did. You're not putting it forth like arguing that this is you can prove it from the Bible, but, but you know, much of the Bible is, is um, it's like a puzzle that we're putting pieces together and trying to uh, uh, come to conclusions, and at least, um, if not a conclusion, a, uh, a, a surmise. We, we surmise things. It's fun to do it. It's nothing heretical about it. We should all be willing to tolerate each other's speculations. Brother, uh, Brother Steve. Yes, 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 indeedy. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. You know, um, I, I love it. I love it. It's uh, the it reminds me of Matthew 24, where Jesus talks about the birth pains of uh, b before the end. Um, and, and we would see the, the birth pains uh, accelerate. And I, I think if, if you're paying attention to, to what's going on worldwide, um, that that's clear and, and that, that the earth is and, and the creation is groaning even more and more because wickedness abounds more and more. And, you know, at the same time, I also believe and am praying for uh a, a, the greatest revival ever to take place ever um from the beginning of of time and that that just as as wickedness will abound that that the grace of god will abound more and more uh in these last days that i truly believe we are you know living in the the very last days but uh you know that, like like Kel said, that that even creation will be restored to what it was supposed to be. Um, not just us who are believers who will be uh, restored to what we are supposed to be, uh, the perfect image of God that Adam and Eve were together in 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 the Garden of Eden, and you know. Um, this you know that that uh some some comments were made in the chat about about all this and and that uh that in revelation 20 when the new heaven and new earth are are you know when we come to that place and we now have access again to the tree of life you know um that that there's no more death anymore in this new heaven and new earth, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. And so that to me is exactly what the creation itself is longing for that, that, you know, it will put on a new, uh, a new body, so to speak, just like we will put on a new body that, that adoption that we wait for that physical adoption We've received the spirit of adoption, just like we were talking about before. And so it's it, Paul is contrasting the fact that we wait for that day. Not only do we wait, the creation itself waits for that day and is is crying out for it, I believe. Just like Jesus said, if if 
you know, no one speaks the truth of the gospel and Jesus, that even the very rocks would cry out. So that's another picture of creation crying out and groaning and travailing in pain because we live in a perfect fallen world. And that does affect creation as well. So not only does creation wait for that new day, but we wait for that new day, that that day that we hope and long for and that day that is assured and promised and is coming. It, you know, uh, it's, it's a fact. So thanks. Hmm. Well, as I was li listening to you, I had some new thoughts that I hadn't ever considered before. Uh, as far as when you said the earth was like the earth is putting on a new, getting a new body too. That's an interesting way of seeing it. But also um, when it says all creation groans, it's uh, and, and when the, you said the rocks will cry out, even the rocks would cry out. There, it seems to be. Uh, I don't. I don't know if it's just language, and I don't know what the proper uh, term for it is. The way the language is being used that way, uh, not to be understood literally, but maybe it. Maybe uh, we should understand it literally, and that the creation itself, which is every all matter, everything that exists is made up of matter. And uh, so all matter or all creation is groaning. So that means that the, the water, the plants, even the soil, the, the earth itself is groaning and has this desire to be uh, the curse removed and to be regenerated. And uh, uh, could it be? Uh, obviously, I, I don't believe in pantheism. Pantheism is the belief that uh, God is creation. You know, Paul talks about the people who are worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And that's kind of what pantheism is, where people worship the mother earth, it's the earth itself. Uh, no, um, God is not the creation, um, but God is present in all creation. But does matter have a mind of some kind that would actually groan? And, and, and I don't know how to take it really. Maybe you guys can give me your, your thoughts on it. Maybe I'm stretching it too far metaphysically. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I got some thoughts on that real quick. Um, if if I, I do think it's you know uh, I think it's literal that creation is groaning, um, and if if uh, in the old in in Genesis when Cain slew Abel, the the voice of his brother's blood cried out to God from the ground. So you know. Um, I believe everything in in God's creation, in a sense, has its own voice. We may not hear it, but God hears it. You know, I don't hear the the voice of of someone's you know blood, but we might feel it spiritually. Um, I know we kind of addressed that on True Story Live uh, uh, several weeks ago, but um, you know if 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 the, the blood has a voice, if creation seems to have a voice, according to this passage, and we have a voice and we cry out to God and God hears us, why can't God hear his creation groaning and travailing? And, you know, that he can hear someone's blood crying out to him from the ground. You know, it's, it's, it's quite awesome when you, when you think about that. When you said matter everything is made up of matter well that's because everything matters to god everyone matters to god just like regeneration 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 
that our very, you know, genetics will be changed and went in the twinkling of an eye, you know, and all this will be made perfect again. It's, it's what we all as believers and everything in creation groans and travails for. So, yeah, thanks. Okay. Thanks. That was interesting. Uh, Brother Cripps, any more on that before we move on? Yeah, I'll just agree uh, with you, Brother Luke, and also what Steve said. All matter matters. That's <laughs> it's it's all of it, and this this ties more into kind of what I was imagining. Uh, again, we don't we don't know for sure that trees could talk. Now Hollywood does portray this in fantasy all the time, where you have talking trees and talking animals and and things like that. There there there's nothing that I've seen that says that animals could speak and things like that. There's some. There's some esoteric uh, books. Is that the right word, Brother Luke? The books talking out. donkeys. Talking donkeys. Well, that was, yeah. God can make a donkey talk, sure. But I, I mean, it wasn't all donkeys could talk, right? Uh, but we don't we don't know what it was like, uh, as Scripture doesn't focus a lot on that. But um, I liked uh, Brother Steve's uh, example uh, from, from, um, from Scripture about the blood, the blood itself crying out from the ground. I, I believe that's literal as well. I think we do ourselves a disservice a lot of times when we look at scriptures is, is not being literal in some cases. Uh, and I won't go too far with that, but there, there are many verses in scripture that, that should be taken literally. And uh, if it says that, that uh, Abel's blood cried out from the ground, why is it so impossible to believe that, that that's not exactly what was happening? Uh, certainly God can hear the voice of blood if it has a voice of some sort. Uh, also, I like the, the Steve playing with the, the, the gene, regeneration. That's, that's absolutely true. So again, it comes back to the whole corruption thing. So we all suffer this corruption of sin. Our, our bodies, all of nature, all matter has suffered. Every, every little bit of it, as you can imagine, uh, including uh, Brother Luke mentioned water. Yeah, I didn't even think about that concept. Uh, we don't know what the consistency of the water was, uh, the water that existed uh, before sin entered. Um, it, who knows? It might have been restorative in, in some way. Uh, I don't know that it wasn't. Um, but, but certainly the oceans and everything, we've corrupted everything. Sin has corrupted everything and pollution and, and all that. It certainly... Um, the reason why our lifespan is so low and, and, it, and it, uh, it, it keeps actually getting lower um, is, is because of the ravages of sin. So why does it not make sense, logical sense, that all matter has been affected by it, including our very genes? I like that Brother Luke talked about we're all born with a birth defect. Uh, you know, we have mortality, which Adam and Eve could have lived eternally and, and stayed in that state with God if they hadn't sinned. So the, the corruption that affects us all, including ourselves, uh, will be changed and there will be no more corruption. We'll never have to deal with that again. So I think it's all it, it all fits in uh, very well with 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 scripture and with uh, with our imagination, at least. And uh, all ties in. I think it's an amazing thing to consider that things were very, very different uh, before sin entered. We know that it's certainly different now as compared to that period of time. And so it's it's believable to me. And uh, I like that, uh, Brother Steve, and talk, bringing that scripture up. I've thought about that before, too. Um, when I was a kid, especially, you know, I heard that voice. Is, Does blood have a voice? It's crying. Blood's crying out from the ground. That's that's interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, the um, I uh, I do believe that uh, uh, Satan was had the form of a serpent, and that the serpent spoke. Now you know your atheists and the uh, the skeptics you know they like to mock us for daring to think to take something like that literally and they okay even if there's some kind of truth in that you don't really take it that literally do you well why not right. you know when people question about well you don't think Jonah was actually in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights do you come on 
You don't believe this story of a of a, the ark with all the animals in the ark? You take that literally? I yes. Mean, yeah, I do. And my my question to even and some Christians even say things like that because they're they're intimidated by the uh, the atheists and they they don't want to seem like they're stupid or ignorant people so they concede that well that's not too shit shouldn't be taken all literally but i take it literally and, and my argument is to the christian do you believe genesis 1 1 what what's that in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth oh yeah of course well the heaven and the earth do you know this great creation of the heaven and the earth I mean, that's that's uh, it's amazing the creation. Not only the the uh, the out, uh, let's say looking at it outwardly, but going inwardly down into cells. No matter how you analyze it, it's spectacular. And, and, we, and the more we learn, the more we're impressed of this with this creation. And and if God did that, why do you think it's absurd that you know? Jonah and the whale, or Noah and the ark. That's the easy stuff compared to the creation. But I also like the idea, and I've never thought about this before, but uh, actually I did think about this first point I'm going to make, is that, that Eve did not seem surprised that the serpent was speaking. I mean, if, if this was unusual, there should be a, in the conversation, Eve should have heard the serpent speaking and said, what? Am I going crazy? Am I hallucinating a serpent that's talking? She didn't say that. There's no, there's no, uh, it's, it doesn't seem to be odd or out of place at all. Perhaps serpents all spoke. Maybe, maybe uh, all the animals were able to speak. Maybe when they had the animals and they're naming them and petting them, they're, they're actually able to communicate at that time. Maybe in the future, we'll also, uh, people, when I did my teaching on 50 hours in heaven, one of the big questions is always, well, what about animals in heaven? And what about our pets? I mean, I don't want to go to heaven if I can't, if my pet's not going to be there with me. I might love my pet more than anything. And uh, so uh, that's an interesting uh, question, but, uh, Okay. It, could, it could very well be the case that the animals in eternity with us will be uh, supernatural abilities too, like maybe it, it was in the past, and maybe we'll be able to talk. And your beloved pet, instead of looking at them and trying to figure out what they're thinking, they'll be able to talk to you. Wouldn't that be wonderful? All right. I believe it, Brother Luke. I believe it. <laughs> Yeah, okay, uh, the next verse is uh, 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the, the redemption of our body. Okay, Brother Cripps, I'll, I'll read the Amplified too since you... You want the benefit of that. 23 in the Amplified says, and not only this, but we too, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, a joyful indication of the blessings to come, even we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the sign of our adoption as sons, the redemption and transformation of our body at the resurrection. Amen. There's that word that I love, transformation. How many times have I used that? The, the, the daily transformation, uh, the renewing of our minds. That, that, that word transformation, that's exactly what we're waiting for. So here's Paul again. He does this a lot. I love that he does this. He, he keeps pounding this same thing home, and he does it here again in verse 23. So he's saying it again to make sure people, everyone understands. So the first, uh, first fruits of the Spirit are what we have, that joy that Brother Luke talked about at the beginning of the, uh, of the program, that we should be walking around with joy and not fear. And that, that you know, the first fruits of the Spirit are, are that joy that we have in what Christ has done for us. Uh, and this part, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, 
that's that feeling. Uh, Brother Luke knows this more than any, and I'm not making fun of him. He just happens to be older. Uh, but I'm experiencing some things at my age. Uh, the first thing that goes is your your eyesight starts to. Uh, I never needed glasses until I turned forty. Turned turned forty, and I had to have reading glasses. Unfortunately, at least at this point, that's all I have have to do is I have to wear reading glasses now. But my body is deteriorating, whether I like it or not. It's 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 starting to um, show the signs of some aging. And uh, it's the way it is. I mean, it doesn't bother me. I'm happy to turn whatever age I am because I know that whatever age I'm at in this world, that I live eternally because of his gift. And, and eventually when I do get that redemption of the body or the transformation of the body, um, I will be able to see perfectly. And I'll be able to do a great no number of other things too that are a, a gift of God and being joint heirs with Christ. And so again, um, Christ is the first fruits of the body, of the eternal body, and will be given that as well. Uh, for instance, I, I don't know if anyone's heard me say this, but I'm, I was born deaf in my left ear. I've never heard a single sound out of my left ear ever. So my body groans to be able to hear like normal people. Um, I have felt like I was uh, different than others, and I am, because I can't hear out of that ear. So um, I look forward to one of the things that I've prayed about my whole life when I was a kid. I prayed for healing in my ear, and God, for whatever reason, has not chosen to give me full hearing. But it's something that I look forward to when I get my eternal body. Uh, and who knows, maybe I'll be able to hear better than everyone else. I don't know. Someone that's deaf their whole life here on this earth and, and they're saved and they, they've they accepted as a free gift, you know, they might have that same thing. If someone was mute, maybe they have the most beautiful voice ever. I don't know. Uh, but it's very possible. But we do know that we have that feeling inside us, just just kind of sitting there at the surface, that that groaning and desiring to have that, that eternal body that we've been promised. It's written into our spirit, I believe. I mean, the groaning and the the uh, the part of us that looks forward to that to that uh, transformation from the amplified version. I love that word transformation, and I, I myself am certainly groaning to have the hearing in my left ear and to have full sight again, and to have all the other things that are beyond anything I could ever ask for or think. Thank you. Amen. Brother Steve? Yes. Yes. Love it. For we know, wait a minute, and not only ourselves, and not only they, but ourselves, not only they, not only creation, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Everything that pertains to life and godliness, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, self-control, those things that the Spirit gives, including the giftings, but even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption to to it the redemption of our body i mean that's that's just like jason said that's that's exactly what we are longing for and you know he started this whole thing back in you know verse 17 and i'm sure he said it several other times as well but you know this whole part so far is just about this this adoption we've received the spirit of the adoption we've we've had the the adoption of of the the quickening of our spirit you know the 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 that redemption has already taken place uh our our the 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 receipt of 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 being born again the seal of the holy spirit but you know we, we we live in this in this in state world, and we wait for the totality of all things being made new that Christ did at the cross 
that we wait for the manifestation of the totality, the, the fullness of what has already been finished. It is finished and we wait for the completion of the of the finished work in time. So, you know, it's it's a he's just I think he's just, you know, over and over repeating the same thing that, you know, we have this blessed hope. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. But these earthen vessels are flesh that must be destroyed and we must put on immortality because of it. And we wait for that day. And it's a beautiful promise and hope. It's a sure hope. Thanks. Wow. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to bring up a, a, a subject, an idea that is... Uh, Probably a lot of people haven't considered what I'm going to say now, but uh, I, I did a, a teaching and they had a group discussion on uh, what is the state of the dead. And there's two questions. What is the state if I die right now and then the resurrection of, the, of all humanity happens, say, 10 years from now, in this intermediate period between my death and my resurrection, what is this is my state of existence. Uh, and um, there are a lot of people with all different opinions, but the one opinion is that you're, you're, uh, you're dead completely, body, soul, spirit, you're just completely dead. Or that's, they soften it up by saying you're, you're asleep, you're, you're you don't have any consciousness. But what they really believe is that you've completely died, even your soul, everything's dead. Uh, so I had to, to disprove that in, in, in the teaching that I did on that subject, um, I, I came to the conclusion that the, the human, a human being, uh, since we're created in the image of God, we are created as a trinity, body, soul, spirit, and yet one Luke, one triune, uh, three distinct uh, persons, body, soul, spirit, and yet one person. Uh, so we're not a complete person without a body. Uh, so I believe that these verses I'm going to read you now, Paul is referring to that intermediate state where if you die and you're, you're in intermediate, you're waiting for the resurrection, that you're not, you're not content being without a body. You're, you want a body. Our body is, we're, we would desire to have a body. It's like, and here's why, tell me if you're not getting that out of these verses. Second Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 5, it says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, and of course that means we die, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So that means we die, but we go to this, to be with God in heaven. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. The dwelling is the body. I'm, my mind is really my identity of who I am. But my mind is my soul. That's who I really am. My body is the tent or the dwelling place for my soul. And you don't want a soul existing apart from a body. Uh, so Paul's talking here about how in this intermediate state, without the tent, without you're, you're naked, without, without a body. But I find it interesting, Brother Cripps, uh, you talked about how right now, I mean, we, you know, you have physical problems and as we get older, it's inescapable. We get more and more things failing and with medicine and medical science, they're able to do a lot, but it's inevitable. Unless the transhumanism gets perfected and they give people immortality with technology. But 
until that happens, uh, and of course, I believe if, if that does happen, that Jesus is going to come back, and that'll be when he returns to stop that. But uh, the point I'm making is that uh, right now, I'm not happy having a body. <laughs> I just got some test results back the other day from the doctor saying I, I got another another problem that was it was fixed but now it's it's recurring again so uh, I can expect that uh, I probably will be in a wheelchair again in the at some point it's inevitable unless there's a miracle and, and so I'm I have all these issues and pain you know. Uh, it's not just me. We're all suffering from from pain. Some people have chronic pain. It's something we live with every day, and we we yearn to get out of this body and escape it. But once we get out of this body, we're going to also be groaning to get another body because it's not natural for a man to exist without a body. But at least we know that when we do get that resurrection, that body, then that it doesn't come with all of the the problems that we got with the first birth, the first birth where, you know, born with all these birth defects, you know, we are born wrong. That's why it's necessary to be born again. <laughs> all right. I don't know if you want to say anything about that or move on, but. Yeah, I, I, I'd say something about it real quick, because you mentioned transhumanism and, and that's a whole nother topic, but I just wanted to touch on it briefly. I believe that they will uh, come up with something that gives people the promise of eternal life. But based on uh, the way Revelation is set up and the way that it's described and the way that uh, that somehow goes hand in hand with the mark of the beast and whatnot. And we know that it's going to be a botched attempt. We know that the, the, the uh, sores and stuff that we get, the, the people that take the mark will be tormented day and night. Uh, and, and they, they'll want to kill themselves, but they can't die. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a promise, uh, this transhumanism thing. And, and, um, uh, definitely if anyone has an interest in doing that, there's plenty of, uh, information out there uh, of what they're trying to set this transhumanism up to be. It's everywhere now. Um, and I believe it'll be, it'll be a botched attempt. They'll promise people that with the mark. Uh, they'll be able to live forever, and they will find out pretty quickly that it will fail because nobody can do what God can do. God created our bodies to live, and then when sin entered in, uh, we have to pay the physical price, the first death, the physical death, uh, and all of us will have to go through that unless we live long enough for Christ to return. Uh, but that's, that's the price that has to be paid, but fortunately our souls are made alive unto Christ, and our soul doesn't die. It goes immediately to him while this flesh, this flesh suit, this zombie suit will be uh, left right here. And, uh, you know, we're not taking it with us. Uh, so it's better not to fall in for these things. Now, I'm not saying it, just to, to make it very clear, if you need hip replacement or you need your, you know, you have an artificial limb or something, that's not transhumanism. That's uh, technology to use to, to, to do things like that so you can walk and, you know, for people that are deaf and they, they, some people, they have an operation or whatever, they can restore their hearing to, to a certain extent. Uh, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the promise of living forever. And there are many people that are striving for that. And that is because they don't want to accept Christ, uh, God's way of redemption and being under subjection to his, his uh, laws and, and uh, the way that he says to do things. So they, they think that, the, that by living forever that they'll avoid death and therefore avoid judgment, and they're sorely mistaken. Um, so I think that's a good point that you made, uh, Brother Luke, and um, uh, there's definitely plenty of information out there. We don't want to, to fall into the trick, the lie, the deception uh, that man's going to come up with some way for us to live forever. We accept what, uh, what Christ's redemption gives to us which is this flesh, we don't want this flesh to live forever. Even if they found a way at this point, Brother Luke, for, for us to live forever in the current state that we're in now, that means that I'll never have the, the hearing that I so look forward to. I'll never have my eyes restored where I don't need reading glasses and every other thing that's going to come. Who would want to live forever in this world? I don't get it. And the, the world the way that it is, this broken, fallen world, who, who would want to live forever? And the only reason they want that is because they fear death and they they fear judgment 
but the judgment's going to come anyway, unfortunately. But we don't have to worry about that because we're not under judgment. We're not under the the, uh, the corruption. We're under the promise of redemption. We've already been redeemed if we've believed and accepted his gift. So we don't have to worry about that. So we just ride it out. And by the way, Brother Luke, we'll definitely pray about whatever those uh, results are that you're dealing with. And that, unfortunately, that's 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 part of the example of this fallen world that we're living in, the, the physical uh, problems that come for a lot of us uh, as we age. Uh, but fortunately, Brother Luke, just like all of us that have believed, um, you're you're looking forward to that that the, the same thing that we just read the verse for. We have that um, have that hope in uh, in the transformation of our bodies in the end, and you'll never have to suffer all those things again. And I look forward to that for you and also for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um... For, for the people who are not familiar with this subject of artificial intelligence, uh, usually called AI and transhumanism, uh, I, I did do a couple of discussions on it. I think we have Renee and uh, Brother Jason Jack and I think Matthias. Um, several of us joined, came together and, and did a couple of uh, talks on my playlist on that. I think it's called AI in transhumanism, uh, inevitable, imminent, and existential. So that's the title. But uh, if you're not familiar with this subject, I think it will be a very interesting subject. And I think it's also important for us to know because the way that we basically, we've all concluded that with these advancements, these scientific advancements, that uh, it could very well be that this mark that uh, people will be offered uh, is, uh, do you want to be enhanced um, through medical science and receive immortality? They've, it's, science has advanced now to the point where we can give you immortality by enhancing you with machines and genetic and alterations and that, and you'll have immortality. What? You, you think you, you believe in Jesus and you think you get immortality? Well, well, you can believe in that fairy tale if you want, or you can have science and we can give you immortality now uh we we pretty much all agree that that is where it's headed so i think it's important for us to all be aware of what's going on with science and and and, and the possible uh, choice that uh, people will be offered uh, okay i think that uh we we'd like to uh, like to quit it's at 8 8 p.m in las vegas so it's 11 p.m back uh east where you guys are uh so uh why don't we now uh, we'll pick up with the next verse. I thought we'd get through this chapter, but uh, we, we're just a bunch of three blabbermouths, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, we. you know that we are. Yeah. I saw in the chat room some, some, some of the people were talking about, oh, they were looking forward to getting to, uh, you know, through verse 30 or whatever is one of their favorite verses. But we, we, yeah, we certainly didn't get there tonight. But I think all these other things that we talked about, I think it's important. It, it ties into things. And I think that we... Um, uh, sometimes we just focus more on the verses and we get all the way through it, and that's great. But, uh, you know, we're taking the time that we need, Brother Luke, and I think that that's uh, the good way to do it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Steve, I don't remember if you if you talked about this last verse or not. So if you didn't take a turn on it, go ahead, and otherwise, otherwise we'll take the time to sum up everything. Is that verse uh, 24 or 23? Uh, 23. 23. I did talk about verse 23. Okay. Well, I didn't think we'd gotten to verse 24. No, we, we have not. Uh, okay. Okay. So we'll pick up 24 next time. And I'm pretty sure next time, 24 through uh, 39, that's 15 verses. That's, we might not be able to finish those 15, but I think we can make an effort to go a little faster just to make sure we finish it up next time. Uh, Okay, I, I th think you're right, though. It's better to, to go through um, uh, too slowly rather than too quickly. If we're going to err, let's be more thorough rather than sk skim over it. Uh, all right, let me ask each of you to uh, take a minute and kind of sum up your thoughts. If there's anything you would like to uh, highlight from the talk or uh, start with you, Brother Steve. Okay, um, I, I love this 
this is one of my favorite chapters in scripture. I mean, I have so many favorite passages, but you know, um, uh, you know, for, for those that like, you know, struggle, struggle in sin and different things and, and whatnot, you know, um, that all of us still sin. That's, you know, part of the, the glorious gospel that, you know, he, he, he saves us as we are knowing that, you know, we, we, we will still sin, but his blood covers us um, regardless. And it's not of works, you know, we're not saved by our own righteousness, which in God's eyes, without, without the imputed righteousness of Christ, we're all, all our righteousness is filthy to him. It's like a use, uh, the, the correct modern day translation of, of our righteousness as filthy rags would be our righteousness is like a used tampon. So, you know, without the imputed perfect righteousness of Christ, we're all, we're all doomed, but because we have believed the record of his son, of God's son, Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection alone, apart from works, that it's by his mercy and his grace that he saves us through faith. And so this is what we all long for, you know, and we all wait and, and, and indeed do suffer uh, for a time, um, whether, you know, uh, some struggle more with with one sin over another doesn't matter it doesn't change the fact that if we have believed we are saved um and you know uh that was you know in part some of what we we talked about on on my last broadcast is that uh christ jesus the messiah the anointed one the savior holds all things that we need in his hands and to abide in him, whether you, you struggle with an overt sin or not, whether, you know, um, that salvation is in his hands, that grace is in his hands, that strength is in his hands. And though the suffering may seem harsh at times, if we abide in Christ, we can walk in victory. But as we, as we abide in him, you know, because it says apart from him, we can do nothing. So be saved, then abide and continue to abide and continue to abide and continue to abide. And so, you know, Paul is saying this is what we long for. We all, all of us whether whether we have been set free from some specific sins or not um the the answer is in Christ the answer is in him and so so spend your time there with him and let him grow in you and and walk with him and don't be condemned uh, by the voices of the world and by the voices that say uh you know uh, go back to bondage. No, go continue in Christ because in Christ, those of us who are saved are new creations and new creatures already seated in heavenly places and there is no condemnation. And I love this verse. All things are uh, lawful to me, but not all things are expedient or beneficial. All things are permissible but not all things are beneficial and will not be brought under the power of, of them. And we do that by abiding in Christ. And, you know, so just remember that all things are now lawful to them who are in Christ. So let's move on in abiding in him. And by abiding in him, we learn how to serve him. Thanks. All right, uh, very good summary, uh, Brother Cripps.
please sum up your thoughts. Sure, thank you. So we started out uh, with Brother Luke kind of talking about that uh, fear that people deal with, and uh, and we as believers should have uh, joy and peace that comes in having the promise of uh, eternal life in Christ, uh, and we should be looking forward to that. And then uh, in studying the verses, then we hear Paul talking about the the groaning and all the things and and how uh, all of creation travails, and, and, and we long for that as well, for that transformation. Um, so it, the, the point is, is, stands out to me pretty clearly, uh, at least from Paul, for sure, that we should have that joy and that peace, uh, knowing that even though it's tough here, we have the hope, and we look forward to that transformation that's to come. And that no matter what we face in this world, no matter what circumstances come our way, what, whatever health problems that we have that we have to deal with here, whatever persecution that we undergo, uh, everything, everything that we face here in this broken, fallen world, we still have the hope of better things to come. And uh, we have that hope because of what Christ did for us. It's not uh, it's not anything that we did, as uh, Steve, Brother Steve mentioned about our righteousness being I'm not going <laughs> to, he already made the point very clear. I don't have to re-mention it, but yeah, our, our righteousness is nothing. It, it's worth nothing uh, compared to his righteousness. And we can have that hope. All we do is uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then we don't have to worry about all these other things. Uh, we, we uh, I used to hear a phrase growing up that would, he, that would be hurled at some people that were real quote unquote, spiritual people, they would say, well, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And it's, it's such a crock. Um, I don't, you can't be too heavenly minded. Yes, of course. It's, it's, uh, you know, we hear through scripture that especially when like the Israelites were in slavery, you know, God told them, you know, make your homes, have families, you know, do all the things that you would normally do if you weren't, you weren't slaves. And in some ways, we're, we're slaves uh, as far as the, the world that we live in. We're, we're subject to the, the, the laws that are here. We're subject to the monetary system. Uh, you know, we're, we're subject to a government. Uh, so we can still uh, have that joy and that peace and look forward to what's to come. Because what we're looking forward to is worth far more than anything that we go through here. And that's a beautiful promise. And uh, lastly, just uh, say uh, good night to everyone in the chat room. It's been a pleasure as usual. And thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yes, amen. And uh, I, I'll sum it up very briefly, but uh, we started off establishing that uh, a Christian is a person who has the Holy Spirit of God in them. And uh, that's, that's how you can actually define a Christian. Uh, you have to have the Holy Spirit in you to be a Christian, and you have to believe on Jesus Christ uh, for your uh, salvation. Believe that it is guaranteed and settled and, and that uh, you, you're assured eternal life because of what Jesus did for you. And that's the means by which we get this Holy Spirit in us. And that now when the Holy Spirit comes into us, it, the Holy Spirit will um, bear witness that you are indeed a child of God. And what comes with that is the uh, assurance and peace and joy that we, we enjoy. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll pick up with uh, the next verse next time. Hopefully we'll finish the chapter next time and then get off to uh, Romans 9 where the Calvinists are making their bed. And uh, you know, a lot to say about that. Uh, okay, uh, Brother Cripps, thank you uh, for uh, joining me again, and uh, Brother Steve, I appreciate you filling in for Sister Renee again tonight. Thank you for being a, a faithful substitute when needed. Appreciate it very much. And, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invite. Okay. It's a blessing to be with y'all. All right. And don't forget to join me Friday night. I'll be interviewing Brother Esteban uh, Melted Zone at, at 6.30 p.m., Pacific time. Uh, all right. Thanks for watching and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.